Today, the top 18 things that Elliot and I wish you knew about fish health, starting with number one. Yeah, the first of that is that all these fish, they can actually live a lot longer in captivity than they can in the ocean. Um, you know, the majority of which, at least five years, most of them 10 to 20. You know what? If it lasts less than five years, this is probably a you and me problem and not the fish's problem. And these things are all solvable. This series is absolutely going to do that for you. The goal here is something that we could all be proud of, which is in our tanks, they live longer than they probably would in the wild. Number two, I wish you didn't have to know this, but it's true and it can be changed but a majority of the fish that come in probably won't make it. Yeah, you know, a lot of fish, they were caught by a diver, they were put on a boat, then they went to a distribution facility, then they went to a wholesaler, then they went to a different wholesaler, then they went to your fish store, and then they went to your house. You know, that's a lot of time being moved, being stressed, being exposed to disease, not being treated properly. You know, it's a lot of just, um, you know, overall stress and things that would compromise the fish's health. So there's a lot of different things that we can do that as reefers to change that trajectory so that statement is no longer true. You can definitely change it so it's no longer true for you, for sure. We can do the quarantine methods, we can do the diet, we can change the trajectory so the fish actually lives longer in our tank than it does in the wild, but we can also choose where to buy this fish and who to buy it from in a way to reduce any of those mortalities that happen along the way because the future of our hobby depends on changing this so that statement isn't true in the future. Number three, this goes against everything I've ever been told about selecting my fish, but seeing the fish in person at the store might not necessarily be better. Yeah, you know, I mean, there are a lot of benefits to seeing the fish in the store though. Uh, you know, you can definitely identify when the fish is in that end stage when it's definitely not a good idea to bring that fish home. Um, but, you know, when you do get good, and we're going to kind of show you how to do it, but when you get good at identifying what actually ails the fish, um, you'll know how to treat it as well, opposed to if it was maybe drop shipped to you. Um, you know, it could come with whatever. You know, you can see, you can like covered in ick, covered in velvet, uh, you know, super heavy breathing. Open you sores, know. like your anema. Yeah, dude, like it's got uh, scratching itself. You could actually avoid all of that type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's more subtle stuff that, you, you know, most people would notice. We will teach you how to see that. So there is benefit to seeing it in the store, but there is a flip side to this as well, which is I'd actually like to capture it before three stages of distribution, yep. meaning the soonest I can get it from the time it left the ocean, the soonest I want to get it to my own tank. Number four, we said it in the previous episode, but diet, what, frequency, and how often, more important than anybody recognizes. Yeah, you know, diet, super, super important. You know, all these fish that we're taking from the ocean, they have specialized diets, you know, and it's unfair to think that, you know, I'm going to feed the same pellet to every species of fish that I'm going to keep. Um, you know, fish like Moorish idols, fish like purple queen anthias, you know, fish that are often listed as expert only. Um, it's mainly because they have special feeding requirements and most people aren't either willing to do the work or they just don't know. I think most people just don't know. Yeah. I'm going to go on a limb here and say <laughs> that uh, diet might be just as big of a killer as uh, parasites and disease in the tank. Mm -hmm. And sadly, it, like actually optimistically and sadly, way, way easier to solve. Yeah. And all you really need to do is think, like half of the solution here is just think, what does this thing eat in the wild? How frequently does it eat it? Mm -hmm. And get as close to that as you can, and you will probably make huge, huge gains. In fact, we'll all make those gains together uh, because when I watch them um, snorkeling, and I'm watching tangs all day, mm -hmm. they are not hunting down shrimp. They're <laughs> eating algae off the rocks all day, and let's emulate that. When I'm watching those antheas, I'm watching them eat plankton all day long, let's emulate that. When you're watching uh, the uh, angels, they're eating sponges and algae, mm -hmm. emulate that, and you'll be more successful, and we can change the trajectory of this for us all. Number five, exercise. Good for us all. Uh, there aren't a tremendous amount of studies on this, but there aren't very many instances where matching an organism's natural environment and energy expenditure isn't wise. Yep, I mean, think about tanks. You know, most of us have tanks in our tank for algae control. You know, they're used to swimming hundreds and hundreds of yards a day, you know, and a tank like this, it's only six feet. A good way to remedy that, increase the flow. 
Um, fish like Achilles tanks, soul holes, clown tanks, those fish are actually really hyperactive fish. That's also why they're a lot ag more aggressive, um, you know, just because they're used to actually using that amount of energy. You can think about this in terms of uh, like organ health, but you can also think about it in terms of stress, like uh, keeping a German Shepherd in a studio apartment yeah. or a hamster without a wheel. What is it going to do? Just sit in the corner until it dies? So in this case, man, if you have the super active tangs that live in tidal zones, uh, part of you know getting rid of their stress and part of their daily environment is swimming against currents. So mm -hmm. you, using flow to create those currents in our tanks is actually wise. Six, it's not all doom and gloom. Healthy fish can live with parasites sometimes for a very long time. Yeah, you know, like flukes is a great example. You know, a lot of fish, they do carry flukes. It's not always, you know, those big identifiable uh, body flukes, but a lot of times it's in the gills. A lot of times with angelfish, it's around their mouth. Um, but a lot of times it doesn't get treated, but those fish will live in people's tanks for years. You'll never know. Um, it's usually only once the fish becomes compromised and their immune system is shot that those type of things usually take over the fish. And then that's when you really start to have to worry about it. We like to all think that we're, our tanks are going to be parasite free. We're going to uh, practice, uh, you know, perfect eradication. We'll never be in there. Uh, the sad part about that is really, I mean, that's probably sub 10% uh, today, yeah. maybe even less than that. Uh, but most of us can actually live with these diseases in there and it'll never affect uh, the fish in there or the other ones around it to any great degree because we practice those management methods where we keep the parasites down. We, we think about how are the populations down. We think about uh, the diet. We think about how to make a stable environment where if a heater goes out, the temperature isn't going to drop because we have backups, <laughs> we have warnings. We're going to get rid of all of those stress events because we're going to manage to the fact that it probably is in there and fish can live with parasites and we can manage to it. Number seven, End stage is end stage. Uh, you know, a lot of times when you see that fish and it's just covered in white spots, a lot of times it's too late to save it, particularly if it's something as virulent as velvet. Um, some things it is. You know, if it's ick, you have a little bit of time. But uh, we'll show you how to identify all that type of stuff. If you're Googling velvet for the first time because you think you have it, dude, it's too late. Uh, there are precursors to all of that, and we are going to teach you what they are. But I think a really important component of this is that most of the things that the hobby thinks of as signs that I might have that is actually the end stage of having it. Number eight, this is hard pill for a lot of people to swallow, but it's absolutely true. Most fish have at least one type of parasite from the wild or from transport. If you think about the process that the fish go through, I mean, one, they're wild fish, they're exposed to everything and anything, um, but then they go into controlled environments where the exposure is a lot higher. Um, you know, and then you're mixing fish from all over the world with other fish and, um, you know, the chances of you getting fish into your home aquarium after it's gone through all those stages that we listed through earlier, it's very unlikely. Most fish will have at least one type of parasite from the wild or transport. Mm -hmm. Hope and pray really doesn't take us very far. Number nine, this is a pretty unpopular statement, yeah. but I don't think there's anything I've ever said that's truer. Cheaper is rarely cheaper when it comes to pets. Yeah, you know, I mean, quarantining, it's not a cheap thing. It's also not uh, cheap on labor either. You know, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of prep. And a lot of times when you're doing it, um, you're making an investment. You know, the idea is that you're treating the one fish and you're doing one fish at a time, but long term, you're protecting, you know, all the pets you already have in your tank. And you're also protecting that one fish that you're also treating. Um, you know, from potentially having to be replaced, which, you know, if you got to replace a fish multiple times, <laughs> that fish didn't cost that one price once. <laughs> Three times. Uh, in fact, if it wiped out your entire tank, it yeah. cost it uh, 10, 15 <laughs> times. Number 10, we're all told that eating means that it's healthy, uh, but it really means different things. Yeah, you know, just because a fish doesn't eat doesn't necessarily mean that that fish isn't healthy. You know, if you have a fish that's in a tank with a bunch of other fish and it's not eating, for all you know, it's totally healthy fish. It's just not eating because of social pressure. You know, fish don't always have to be actually physically beating up another fish for it to feel uh, uncomfortable in its environment. You know, 
if it's eating, it's definitely a plus, you know, and you can be assured that that fish is adjusted because it is in fact eating, but uh, it's not make or break. You told me a good example of the blonde naso tang. Yeah, okay, so blonde nasos, they are the type of fish that, you know, a lot of times they don't eat in QT, and a lot of times it's because they're in a tank that's small, uh, but the second they get into a big tank with a lot of space, they usually will start grazing right away. So you really need to look for different things. Uh, if it's eating, it's definitely good news. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but just because it's not eating doesn't necessarily mean it's bad news. So many of the things that we'll go through in this series where you could look for, is the fur, uh, fish look like it uh, has a, doesn't have a descended stomach? Does it have bright eyes? Does it look alert? Mm -hmm. Those are often maybe even better signs, especially with a big fish like that, that this is a healthy fish that you can bring home. Number 11, the rule Nazis probably won't agree, but uh, this is a numbers game and it's not always about absolute perfection at every stage for everyone. Yeah, you know, I mean, we're gonna show you guys how to put a protocol together on how to quarantine fish. Um, always quarantining in some form of another, even if it's just observation, it's always better than not doing it at all. You know, it's a good example. Let's say you buy a fish from a local fish store. It looked perfect, it was eating. You know, three days after you have it, even if you were just observing it, it broke out in velvet. How heartbroken would you be if that was in your display tank? And now all of your fish are potentially in jeopardy. I would say that the uh, hope and pray method, probably a 5% path to a successful five years. Uh, if you did eradication method uh, of uh, QT, had uh, perfect attention to diet, had absolute attention to redundancy in system design and architecture, uh, and then all of the alarms set up and were rapid fire to fix all of the things, 95% path now. The answer is, uh, 95 might be unobtainable for some people, but five is actually way, 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 way too low. Most of us can reach at least 50. Number 12, I don't understand what you guys are talking about. My fish look just fine and I haven't done any of this stuff. Well, that's because stress events push healthy fish over the edge. Yeah, you know, bringing back to that point earlier, you know, all fish carry some form of parasite. You might just be lucky, you know, you didn't have that stress event yet. If temperature swing, aggressive fish, bad diet, any of that type of stuff, it's really going to take a fish that could be in really good health, you know, but in a short amount of time compromise its immune system, it'll give that chance for those parasites that it might be carrying to take over. Now, if that's the case, it's all about thinking about how do I reduce the chances that I'll run into one of those stress events? How do I get around power outages or anything else? Because those things are what's going to prevent this from breaking out in your tank. Number 13, same thing, different angle, meaning assume the fish are compromised when they come in. Yeah, you know, if you've ever been to a wholesaler and you've seen the fish and then you've gone to the tropics and seen some of the fish that we keep in aquariums, there's a very stark difference. You know, the fish in the wild, they're alert, they're lively, you know, they don't have uh, descended stomachs, you know, they've been feeding regularly, all this stuff, but then the fish that you usually see when they first come in, they're lethargic, you know, they have suppressed immune systems, they might have extra amount of disease on them because they were held prior to receiving there. You know, all these things kind of go a long way. And then most of the time when you get that fish at that, you know, last stop, you know, they've already gone through four or five different chains of um, transfer. And, uh, you know, they've just been more and more compromised every step of the way. So it isn't absolutely true that every single fish comes with a parasite on it because all yeah. is an encompassing word. They're just <laughs> never true. But if it's more than half, it's probably wise to just assume that the fish are always compromised in the come when they come in and why that medicated quarantine before they go in your tank is always the right move. Number 14, there are non-parasite issues as well, uh, a little easier to solve in many cases. Yeah, you know, a lot of times when fish first come in, like when we get shipments from overseas, a lot of times the fish will be kind of hypoxic because they've been in a bag for a really, really long time. Um, what that kind of looks like is, you know, the fish might have dilated pupils, uh, its respiratory might be, you know, incredibly minimal, um, it's almost non-existent. Um, you know, the fish could be anemic or emaciated, they could also be exhausted, you know, if, you look down the body of the fish and it looks like it's compressed opposed to, you know, being more torpedo shaped and there's actually like a good healthy amount of meat around the spine. Um, you know, you can be pretty confident that fish is emaciated. If the fish has been in transit and you know that it's probably gotten thrown around in a box for a long time uh, and it's laying down, 
you know, I don't know about you, but if I was thrown around in a dark box for a few days, I'd probably want to take a nap, you know, um, you know, and anemic, it's just lack of oxygen supply a lot of times. And you kind of run into that with, um, you know, thinner filament um, fish. Emaciated, this is a big piece of it. If you didn't know what to look for, uh, you may not know what a thin fish looks like. Mm -hmm. So pay attention to that piece, look on it dead on. It should look like a torpedo uh, and not uh, squished in any uh, yeah. point <laughs> along the way. It shouldn't look compressed. Yes, uh, and exhausted. If it's not running away from your net, it's probably exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> Number 15, this one goes against everything I've ever heard in my DNA, but sometimes, not watching the fish closely for the first 24 hours might be best. Yeah, you yeah, know, I mean, I think uh, everyone's reaction when they get a new fish and it's not behaving normally is to intervene, you know, because we're worried about the fish, you know, we're concerned about it, we want to try to fix it, a remedy, whatever's wrong with it. But a lot of times fish will display weird behavior when they're not in a comfortable environment. If they're new, they're being harassed, you know, they could be uh, tired or any of those other things we listed previously, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's something wrong. And it's really a lot of times that when you're trying to fix it and trying to intervene that you end up stressing the fish out more. You know what? Uh, this makes total sense to me, uh, even though it goes against my DNA because I've seen it with corals over and over and over again, where coral doesn't look good. So mess with it seems to be the right option when it's actually the absolute uh, mm -hmm. opposite. It isn't turn the lights up because the fish or the coral isn't yeah. doing well, move it. Uh, very similar principle. <laughs> leave it alone and most of the times it will turn around. Number 16, this might be one of the biggest advancements that the hobby could ever go through. Mm -hmm. And that's not enough people use isolation boxes for the introduction of fish. Yeah, you know, I mean, when a new fish goes into an established tank, it's a hard adjustment. A lot of times that fish is stressed out. You know, it's not gonna wanna eat right away. And if it's getting harassed or it's getting intimidated by the existing fish that are already really established, you know, it's not that far-fetched to think that that fish won't do well. Um, you know, one of the things that you can also do to make it comfortable is include a hide inside the uh, isolation box. You know, make sure that that fish is going to feel comfortable so it can adjust well and, you know, integrate into your aquarium. When you build a, a, a box that can go inside of the tank and feed it and it can live happily in there for a, like a period of weeks and even months, uh, let it live in there. And then when I remove the box and it goes out, None of the other fish care about it at mm -hmm. all. A totally different success rate, like dramatically lower mortalities. In fact, I haven't even seen one after doing this. So you can go from almost certainty that this is gonna go bad to almost certainty that it won't. Number 17, this is a upper echelon skill set, but uh, consider natural habitat of the fish mm -hmm. and you'll have higher success rates as well. Yeah, you know, a lot of fish, when we are designing those, uh, you know, perfect aquascapes for coral placement. We're not taking fish into consideration. A lot of times fish like fairy wrasses, a lot of times fish like tangs, they need very different habitats. You know, if you look at the habitat for a tang, it's very open, it's a lot of swimming space. If you look at the habitat for a uh, wrasse, you know, like a fairy wrasse, it's usually loose rubble, a lot of caves, a lot of tunnels, a lot of holes. I think of uh, actually Chromis. Uh, one of the cooler things I've ever seen is a friend of mine had a big, huge acro colony mm -hmm. uh, and like 30 Chromis that would live in yeah. it and they'd it's dart like in and out of it. Out. Yeah, it was the coolest thing I've ever <laughs> seen. One of the ones I think of the most is when you shot, uh, uh, showed me the video of yeah. where wrasses live. Mm -hmm. It's a field of rubble yeah. uh, and they dart in and out of it. And sure enough, I glued a bunch of rubble together uh, to create that habitat that had holes in it that comes from everywhere. And that night, my wrasse moved right in. In fact, it's right here now uh, covered in uh, anemones, but <laughs> you can see all of the holes in it. And when I created what that fish wanted, it felt secure and moved right in. Number 18, if uh, we wanna avoid that end game stuff, what does a healthy fish actually look like? Yeah, you know, for the majority, you know, we're talking 80% of the fish. Uh, the fish should have clear eyes. Its fins should be clear. It should be free of spots. You know, it should be swimming normally. It should be swimming alert. You know, if it's like a wrasse, you can look out for spinal damage. If it's a tang, it should be, you know, moving at a relatively agile manner. Um, you don't want the fish to be scratching or flashing. You know, if it's scratching on rocks, it could be something simple, like there's an electrical current in the tank or in the system but not always, something to keep in mind. If a fish is yawning, twitching, 
um, doing like this head shake thing. A lot of times it's indication of flukes. Um, it's learning all those types of things that are really going to help you make a uh, successful um, pet owner. <laughs> I think one of the things that people probably miss the most is that heavy breathing. Right. Yeah. If you see that, that is a precursor to the rest and probably one of the easiest things to actually see because yeah. you can see the gills actually going. It's gasping mm -hmm. for air even through its uh, mouth. You know, when, I don't know, make a um, educated assumption, right? If the fish just came in, like you would go to your local fish store and you know that those fish just came in last night, it could just still be stress from you know being transported. It doesn't always mean something. Um, but if the fish has been there for a while and it's laying down and it's breathing heavy, that's probably a fish that you should skip. Number 19 actually doesn't exist. It's all the misconceptions, all the things you've been told about QT and fish health that are actually wrong. These are the things that are leading us astray and making us not as successful. It's in this playlist right here. You're gonna see that next.